Hi there. Thanks for joining us on Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, where we're saving the earth one flavor at a time by gathering community to share wisdom around the natural connections between our innate sense of taste and flavors that are grown in healthy, regenerative soils. Welcome. Hey there. Thanks for watching another episode of Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, saving the earth one flavor at a time. Today, I have an amazing guest, an honored friend um, with me. Uh, she, when I do interviews, I always send the guests out, you know, a little, little clip, like, tell me how you want to be introduced. So she wants to be introduced as Kelly Newland, Chef Rad Boulder. Really? <laughs> it's nowhere close to the credentials and amazingness of who this woman is. So I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on Kelly's intro. So first of all, she's a very dear friend of mine and um, a mentor for me going through culinary school. Um, I went to culinary school in Boulder, culinary school, the Rockies, and she basically saved our class from like jumping off a cliff. <laughs> Because there was many, many, there was a lot of drama in that class and she kind of swooped in and, and saved the day. We'll get into that a little more. Um, she is a James Beard Award nominee. She has all these credentials and she's just a phenomenal human. She has big dogs, bigger than her. <laughs> Great Dane, St. Bernard, famous St. Bernard, by the way. Just follow Hank Williams up high. Anyway, Kelly, thank you for joining me. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. I'm, it's such a, like a cool circle that we have, right? Yes. Um, from teacher slash student slash friend. Uh, and I, I honestly consider all three of those to have happened simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering, you know, what our class kind of went through, um, and seriously, it was just, it was a bizarre set of circumstances. And um, I was just so grateful that you were there because I learned so much from you. I mean, more than, we basically in a, in a six month period of time, we didn't have a chef instructor when the class started. And then we had a chef instructor, if you could call it that. And <laughs> And then you kind of, and then um, Chef Michael kind of came in and filled in. And then finally you came in and kind of, you know, wrapped it up for us and finally made us feel like we were um, where we were supposed to be. So the little bit of the background of that is um, that I went to culinary school, the Rockies, which I chose to go to late in life. I was, I think I was the oldest one in the class. Um, and uh, it was a farm to table school. That was why I went focused on organic local food and in the process of me applying to school and the school's timing they were being unbeknownst to our class they were being bought out by a French large business kind of culinary school so the whole idea of local organic every reason that I chose to go there was kind of slipping out of the hands of our class right and that's why our whole class went there so anyway so just to start on that note, will you share some of your favorite memories or not so favorite memories of our class time together? Yeah, gosh, I had, um, geez, you guys, I think I was teaching like two other classes at the same time as you all. And I had just started teaching there at the time. Um, I was working with a pastry class and then yeah, some, I thought you were a pastry chef, right? And then some other uh, chef, like a faster program that was just shorter, basically. Um, and then they were like, hey, there's this morning class that really um, needs some help. So uh, it was a lot of moving parts. But I'll tell you, I, I had almost forgotten about and it's really sad, kind of hurts my heart a little. I had forgotten that it's it was actually farm to table and it truly was with your group yeah. um, because the program has changed so much, you know, so after your class, I stayed on for a couple more years and taught full time. Um, and then I phased out to an adjunct instructor. Uh, so it slowly and then very quickly got itself out of the farm to table. So I, I'd have really fond memories of that. When you just brought that up, I thought, oh gosh, I had forgotten all about that. Um, because you all spent a lot of time on farms. Yes. And 
I remember going to like all the farms with you and then as we affectionately referred to as uh, the real world on the farm, yes. our trip out, out to the North Fork Valley, which um, as an instructor is both um, gratifying and uh, will put you, you know, in the mental ward because <laughs> it's so many moving parts and you've got all these groups split up all across these like three or four really tiny towns and uh, yeah, it was chaos. And I, 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 paused at saying organized chaos because I did not feel <laughs> that I wasn't very organized all the time. Um, but I have some really wonderful pictures from your class specifically uh, in Paonia. And I'm like, I look at you, there's one that of you and I like at some greenhouse somewhere geeking out on things. So I think that that location um, that you remember the picture of us from was from Zephros Farm. That was a pretty impactful place because we had a very, um, I'm gonna call it traumatic experience, but also an experience that I believe any chef who serves meat should witness go through experience like profound. And that was the, um, the, the lamb slaughter, right? Yeah, that's always, um, chickens are hard enough, like <gasps> anything, right? Like, oh my <laughs> really God. Those spiders, but um, yeah, that's, gosh, it's, it's always um, taking the life of something should be impactful, right? If it's not, they're, um, I don't, I don't want to pass judgment on anyone, but if it's not, right. um, that's a, there's, I feel like I'm, I'm missing a chip if I'm not um, sort of emotionally crippled by that for many, many days. And it's for some, whatever reason, it's even worse, like the larger the animal and when it's something that, uh, you know, two weeks before that you were doing yoga with it, you know, right. what they like goat yoga. Right, right, right. right. I'm trying like we we have these relationships with animals and you and I are also people who are um have a huge heart towards animals uh so that, that's a big deal um that is not something that the new classes go through so your your class and you know a handful after <clears throat> we still went through that process um so one that will change you forever. Right. You, it bonds your class. Yeah. Um, I remember clinging to Adam's your phone, like <laughs> just like linking arms, like, oh God, it was so hard. It's and so the awesome. farmer was so amazing. He was just, you know, talk about the treatment of animals and meat and all the disgustingness that's out there, right? In in the commercial meat industry mm -hmm. um, with zero reverence for the animals and the disgusting situations, right? In the in the I don't know, I guess they're business owners. I don't even know if you can call them farmers. Um, you know, just thinking about the compassion that that man had, you know, the explanation and the, I remember him just keeping the animal calm, right? Like the importance of just calm, basically doing Reiki on the lamb before, you know, before they just went through the, I just. Yeah, uh, it was I'm just in, like, I'm having this reaction right now to just going yeah. through all of that that was it's a lot um so the, your program was much different because of that for a lot of reasons but because of that and then I think other memories are just you know watching re reminiscing on where the students were at that point in their education and then seeing them now uh, and watching like, oh my gosh, I remember being like, gosh, you know, your, <laughs> your plate does not have to have this Fred Flintstone size pork chop. <laughs> on. <laughs> and then uh, looking at them now, and it's like this beautiful high and tight, like whatever, you know, um, so watching people evolve in our, in your, in their craft is a really cool journey. Uh, so I, I always like to want to keep up with students that become my friends anyway, but um, for anyone that stays in the business, um, watching them evolve through that craft is really cool. Yeah, that's really fun. Yeah. So Randy and Brian, uh, three of them, right, ended up working together, which is so cool. I, just I know. I love that so much. And I follow them. Uh, and Randy and I communicate on and off, you know, um, 
I would say a couple times a month we like shoot each other messages. So, and just following like that sort of thing. Um, yeah, there's a handful of people from your class that um, I, I still keep in touch with and keep in touch with me and just watching um, how their life is now, um, food, is, food as an industry is woven into it is pretty cool. Yeah. It's been, it's been fascinating to watch the business over the last year too, like the, the tragic and the sadness of, you know, just the restaurant business in general. And yet there seems to be this part of it that almost, it's like everything about the food system. I feel like there's parts of it that needed to be broken up. Right. And I don't even know if they're being rebuilt in the right way, but there's definitely things, you know, that are tragic about the food industry and, and the people in it. Um, it's funny right before this episode is released I'm going to be releasing an episode called why I love chefs because <laughs> I do like I I love chefs you know I've just always um since I've been in the restaurant industry I've always loved the passion that chefs have right like you can't you don't see that in other businesses and, and, and unless you work side by side with them and see the commitment and the, you know, the drive and, and this desire to feed people. And, you know, my favorites, of course, are the ones like, like what we were training to be is people that give reverence to the food, right? So part of um, what Kelly referred to in our internship was this farm to table experience. So we actually traveled across to the North Fork Valley of um, Colorado and visited organic farms over there. Um, and had to dig in the dirt. Like we had to participate in what the farmers participate in. And, and I think that was what we signed up for, right? We signed up for recognizing the difference in, um, in how food is grown and how animals are treated and, and giving that reverence to the food. So, you know, I did it late in life. So I knew I wasn't gonna leave there and be an executive chef somewhere, right? But the cool thing was my internship did get me to work with another female James Beard mm -hmm. Award winner, which was um, Jennifer Jasinski of Rioja and Bistro Vendome. And she has lots of restaurants in downtown Denver, but um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for training these kids in a way that they are recognizing food in a very reverent way, right? And that's what I feel like that that experience did, especially the slaughters. We did chicken and lamb. And I mean, I wrote my whole final dissertation. Dissertation? Am I going for a doctorate? No. Um, <laughs> my I final, still have that paper somewhere. Yeah, on, on that experience, right? And how much reverence it just gives you for your food. I, I really have a great appreciation for that experience for you mostly, for everyone in that class. It was, it was just phenomenal. But so you transitioned out of that and now you are running Rad Boulder. So Rad stands for, go ahead, tell us about, tell us about Rad Boulder and how you decided to go that route. Uh, yeah, so Rad stands for Real Athlete Diets. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I love the most about the food industry, uh, and when people ask me, are you in the restaurant industry? I've sort of paused and I feel like I'm not in the restaurant industry, I'm in the food industry. Right. Uh, because there are so many avenues, um, which is a testament to what you previously just mentioned. Like, there's so many options. You don't have to just work in a restaurant or work in a hotel or work in a bakery. Uh, you can do so much more with it. I mean, for example, what you're doing, right? Uh, so <clears throat> I was, I grew up as an athlete, uh, when I was a very, very early age, early, like five years old, I decided I wanted to <laughs> be a chef and I wanted to be a runner. So both of those have been in my life for, for decades. And then I found myself in Boulder, um, doing some contract work while I was teaching, um, you know, people, athletes would reach out and say, hey, can you feed me while I train for this Ironman or for this fill in the blank, whatever. Um, and I more often than not said yes and overextended myself and um, didn't, it was a rare occasion for me to utter the word no. And then one day I was driving home from school from teaching and a friend of mine called and said, hey, can you do this for me? And I said, no, I can't because I was maxed out. Um, and I was also at the time uh, doing some contract work for a um, youth recovery program in Boulder called Aim House. So I was 
working with their um, internal teams and uh, therapists, um, the mem like the participants of the program on how to eat or what to eat. Um, I was work directly with the diet, the registered dietitian that they had, and um, then teach the kids how to cook for the way they were supposed to eat. So I had a lot of balls in the air. So I, I essentially said no to my friend uh, who called and asked if I could feed him through this training process. And then as I hung up the phone, I was like, wait, that's really what I want to do full time. Why am I not doing that? Um, so by the time I got home, you know, seven, eight minutes later, I just told Morgan, I came inside and was like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to start <laughs> this business. I'm going to feed athletes for a living. And um, so then all the things go in your head, like, well, I mean, this is Boulder. So surely someone else is doing this. Surely a handful of other people are doing this, um, but they're not. And they're not because it's really hard. It's also a really um, unique individual that can walk on both paths. Like um, a lot of people ask if they can work with me and they might be great cooks but they also drink like a fish and smoke cigarettes. And I can't have someone taking a cigarette break while they're feeding Olympic caliber athletes. That's not the image one that I want to portray. And I, I, quite honestly, like I don't want to be around all that smoke and neither do athletes. So the habits of most people in the restaurant industry do not cross over into the other world that I walk in. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, I think that would be so great. I love to cook at home and I'm a, you know, trail runner or whatever, um, or I'm a climber. Um, and they maybe walk more in the athlete section, but they don't understand how hard physically demanding the food side of that is. So that's why I was like, I very quickly understood why no one else was doing it. And you're doing it so specialized. And I can only imagine that, um, you know, athletes probably have this, this huge range of what they're asking of you as far as limitations and what they don't want, what they do want, what are they looking for? Um, I know, you know, it, again, in that, that survey that I send to guests before you come on the show, I always ask, you know, is there an episode of the show that you've watched and that you resonated with the most? And you mentioned the one that I talked about food identities, right? Where people have, we have all these food identities in the world right now. And people choose them for all different reasons, right? There's, of course, we have allergies, which you have to be, you know, consistent with eliminating maybe a specific food. But, you know, part of my mission and part of what I'm trying to bring awareness to in the world of flavor is that if we understand flavor, we can kind of let go of identities because there's this these categories of nutrition that fall into flavor, right? So I'm curious what what kind of challenges do you face with that? What, what, what are your athletes looking for? And like, how broad of a range do you have to kind of pigeonhole your food into? Uh, that's a great question. That's another reason most chefs who would be interested in this don't want to deal with it because most chefs don't want to deal with this. Um, I would say 90% of the people that I feed are gluten-free, dairy-free, I do everything nut free unless specifically requested because most of my work is in the field and we're far away from hospitals and I don't want someone to have an anaphylactic reaction to something. Um, so gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free, and then about half are vegan and then the other half are animal protein based. Um, and the biggest reason for, so people don't wanna deal with that. Um, I deal with it every day to the point where everything I do is gluten-free, dairy-free, and nut-free. So it's just, if I just do that all the time, it's easier. Right. Um, but um, they're all things that potentially cause inflammation. Uh, so that's why athletes stay away from it. And a lot of people are like, well, that's, you know, you don't have celiac disease or- I hear that all the time. Right? It's not something that's gonna cause an anaphylactic reaction, but I'll tell you, this is as someone who has an autoimmune disorder, um, a little bit here and there might not bother me, but if I'm running a hundred miles and my body is already completely compromised and trashed, if I add something that I know has has given me some issues in the past, that's when it will happen. 
And I do not want to be responsible for someone not breaking like a world record in something because I couldn't get my shit together and feed them the way they asked. <laughs> Whether it happens or is psychosomatic or what, that's what I'm paid to do. Right. And I think in, I mean, it's 2021, there's, there's no reason to not provide exceptional food that falls into those categories. And honestly, I mean, there are a lot of things that already fall into those categories we just don't think about it. So that's, yeah, that's a day in the life. I have one client that I'll be, I have a big assignment that's starting the end of May and will take me all the way to the beginning of August. Wow. And the athlete is gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free and can't eat eggs and is running, trying to run the fastest known time on the Pacific Crest Trail. That's over 2000 miles. Wow. So I'll be living in a van for 60 days <laughs> wow. cooking remotely um it's also going to be part of a documentary with nat geo oh so, my god that's so awesome <laughs> oh it's so um, amazing but so it's really cool but it's also um i mean i've been working on just organizing this sherry and being as like efficient and tight as possible for months at this point um the project was also supposed to happen last year um, and was obviously put on pause. Um, so now we're coming back to it and uh, yeah, it's a lot. So because of that and because not a lot of people want to do that sort of work, they're like, that's too much. I don't want to do it. Um, and then I'm also cooking it like, you know, in a van or an RV. Um, <laughs> is it, is it something you have already like seen? Like, is this you, something you own or is this something you're renting or like, cause oh, no. I picture like big buses that pull into farms and they're like converted <laughs> into a whole commercial kitchen inside of it. Right. Like I've been to events like that. And I'm like, Holy cow, this is world. Like, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Some of like, <laughs> the client, <laughs> like the brand that hires me. So this is an Adidas sponsored athlete. So the project is funded by Adidas and all the vehicles are taken care of. I just need to get myself there with everything I need and then restock every several days and use the equipment that is available to me. Um, which again is, you know, being able to adapt is a really big deal. Um, and the timing is funny too. It's not like, okay, uh, we have a catering gig and the catering, like it starts at five o'clock, people will sit down. Um, they might say, okay, Tim's leaving at 5.30 in the morning and we think he'll be back, I don't know, at like eight o'clock. Uh, I might be sitting there till 10 o'clock at night waiting for him. Wow. Again, most chefs, as you know, right. we're not a patient bunch, right? We're like, our food is ready. <laughs> <laughs> you have to eat it now. It's all about us, right? This right. is not about me at all. Right. I am the furthest person on the totem pole. So um having what the person needs, having what the athlete, athlete needs and wants, which will change daily because his body will be, he's going to be running, you know, 40 to 50 miles a day for, um, you know, a couple months. So having what they need when they need it um, is my, is my job. That's my responsibility. Um, and it doesn't matter how that affects me. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, if they were supposed to be back two hours before that, like you figure it out and you do your job and you make it work. So that's my next big kind of gig. Um, he's this particular athlete I've been feeding for years for over six years at this point. And he always wants, I always just carry like a bag of salt with me because he always needs more salt. <laughs> um, one, because he's always depleted, but his, and all the athletes, we feed our endurance athletes. So they always, everything is seasoned at a, a higher level than you and I would probably, eat, which is already seasoned, you know, at a higher right. level. <laughs> um, and then I would just bring extra salt for Tim. Um, but I'll tell That's you. That's awesome. I love that. Like, yeah, this is, the, this is one of the categories that I talk about. You know, when I talk about the categories of flavor, we talk about salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami, right? And, mm -hmm. and you could argue fat is a flavor. You could argue the elements like hot and cold and things like that. But salt and sweet are the two flavors that are the most controversial, right? Like, so I always say they're emotionally charged because there's so many people in the world that are eating unhealthy. They're eating packaged foods. They're eating stuff that has all these hidden sugars and all these hidden salts and their bodies are, don't require it. And then they're kind of having to adjust. And then the doctors say, well, stop eating sweet and salt, right? 
So then we have this kind of broad sweeping evilness to anything that's sweet or salty. And athletes are always such a perfect example of why salt matters, right? So speak a little bit to that, if you would, for me um, about, you know, these athletes that are just what they're going through and what salt does to help them recover. Yeah, that's such a great question. And I'll tell you, Sherry, there's, there's a term that kind of goes around um, the endurance athlete circle um, that's called flavor fatigue. Have you heard of this? No, <laughs> I know it's like made for you. Um, so Tim, Tim Olson is the athlete that I'll be working with and he loves things that are either really salty or very sweet. And if you're eating the same thing, I have a laundry list of options and I'm like, all right, this is what he wants right now. This is great. That might be his favorite thing for two days. And then he'll be like, I'm going to vomit if I see that again. <laughs> I can relate to that really. Like, I can't eat any leftovers once is it. Then I'm like, I can't do it again. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if you're out in the woods for, you know, 15 hours straight and all you're eating is strudel. <laughs> <laughs> So what happens is he's, he's like, my mouth is just like done. I can't have that anymore. I need, this is what I'm craving now because his, he's now gotten flavor fatigue from it. So there are these companies, like, I don't know if you've heard of goo, they make these little gels that are a hundred to 150 calories. Um, and sometimes when you're out in these big, long days, your stomach can't take like uh, a sandwich, but it can take a gel. It's just easier to digest but goo makes, I don't remember how many, they, they dozens and dozens. It might even be like a hundred different flavors because people will get flavor fatigue. So they have watermelon, they have salted watermelon, they have cake frosting, they have <laughs> green tea. Um, so that's what I will constantly communicate with Tim on when he's out there. Um, and I, honestly, the way I season food, I get this question a lot your food tastes so great. I don't even like vegetables. These are the best carrots I've ever had. What did you do to them? Yes. Like I have a, a magic potion and all I ever use is um, olive oil, salt, and craft black pepper. That is it. That's all I ever do. But I think people put so much other crap on there. So they're like, I need garlic powder and this and that. I'm like, hold on a minute. You can't even taste your carrots. Right. Uh, so that's that's what happens. And the, the more I can dumb it down out there for someone who's running that many miles and their body is like stretched to its limits, specifically their digestion, um, the less I can put in, but also taste good to prompt them to fuel their body. That's the, that's the like tightrope that I need to walk. Right. And what I love about that. So this is a big difference too, is because I always talk about how, you know, we as humans have cravings and cravings are designed innately to be something that is speaking intelligently to our bodies, right? But when we're feeding our bodies crap and our bodies are confused by a flavor not matching the nutrients that's behind it, then we start craving things, but we don't even recognize that like, for instance, when you crave something sweet, right? We crave something sweet because we think we need the energy. Well, yeah, sweetness does correlate to calories that give you energy, right? But it's so different when you're feeding your body you know, a or an orange candy versus an orange, right? Like it's your body handles it so differently. So cravings when you're eating the right food, like these athletes are doing, right? They can trust their cravings, right? So when they say, I'm craving this to you and you make that for them, that's very different than someone who's craving sweets and goes and eats a big bag of chocolate chip cookies, right? Mm -hmm. Because they trust their bodies. They, they recognize what their bodies need. And when they get it, they feel better and they probably perform better, right? And the other thing I love about that, and I wanted to ask you, so when you're just using salt and pepper to flavor food, because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, and you just brought it up without me even having to ask, is so those carrots that you're getting, are you looking for like specific carrots? Do you work with organic? Do you work with local farms? I mean, I'm sure that's a lot to kind of manage getting local stuff, but I'm curious what you, what you do as far as like choosing those basic ingredients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think first and foremost, like if I can get it from a farm, obviously that's amazing. That's a carrot on a different level, right? Right, um, right, right. And organic as well. But there are times when that just doesn't happen. I mean, I'm going to be out in the middle of nowhere. Right, right. Um, so I know very well that I'm, I'm just going to be, you know, at some point um, 
I, I will be feeling like a lottery winner if I can find a grocery store to buy carrots in so. right. <laughs> of any kind, which will probably be really old, like horse carrots, like as you and I would call them, like a, a giant bag, like five pound bag of carrots that um, are just older than the, you know, the carrots we would get from a farm. Um, but that's, that's what will be available. So it kind of goes down that chain. Like, this is what I'm looking for. Ideal. This is Right. this right. is what do you got <laughs> right 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 and then I would say you know probably bringing in a good quality olive oil is going to actually support that as well right so each in each individual ingredient and this is when I talked about in that episode that I say I love chefs right like chefs that really care about ingredients and see the difference in and 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 correlate it to flavor right um I always feel like this conversation is so easy to have with chefs and with farmers the the correlation and the importance of flavor and how people respond to flavor like chefs get it because you know how to make things taste good and you know how to choose the right ingredients and balance flavors right so um so for instance i always use kale as an example so do you make things with kale all the time Okay. So I how do you make kale? <laughs> how do you make kale taste good? Um, I usually first just massage it so it does not taste like I'm Texture. eating leather. Right. Texture um, is a big deal. Affects the mouth feel right. Right. And then if it's really ugh, and yucky and leathery, then our saliva glands don't work and then our taste buds don't operate. So that and then some sort of usually kind of like a vinaigrette something that with that acid also kind of breaks up the cellular structure right of those yep. of the kale um which again combats everything and then kickstarts everything else so yeah and i'm yeah. a big proponent of just eating like my husband does not eat anywhere near the dark leafy greens that i do which is fine he still gets what he needs i, I probably eat way more than my body can you know honestly do anything with but um, I really like that stuff raw. If I do heat it up, it's like 30 seconds. Yeah. It's really yeah. fast. But um, because I eat so much of that, when I don't have it, that's when my body craves it. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? That's part of training our body. When you eat well and you get to know the flavors and, you, and you're teaching your body what the flavor is doing for it, when there's actually nutrition behind it, it's a whole different story, right? It's a whole different you're teaching your body how to crave the right things. Mm -hmm. um, what I love about what you said, so many things, people don't recognize the importance of texture when they're eating, right? So kale, they'll, they'll somebody will tell them that they should eat kale and they'll go by like, you know, they won't take the stem off and they'll try right. to eat kale. <laughs> and they're like, I'm never eating that again, right? So the texture is a huge deal in all things. Um, I love that you talked about acidity because in my language that translates to sour, right? And I talk about how sour helps to break things down. It's really acts like your digestive juices and your taste buds. So it's kind of starting that digestive process. All you have to do is think about, you know, sucking on a lemon and you start the saliva going and that's, it's just this boost for your digestive system. And you just stated that, right? You just said this acidity helps to start breaking things down opens up your taste buds. Um, there's so much cool stuff too. You know, like I said, this is just a language that comes easily to chefs, to people that know how to make stuff taste good. It's just what you do. And so many people in the world just have no idea, right? Not even aware, not even aware of the categories of flavor and the things that it can do for you. Mm -hmm. um, so the salt, we were going to talk about the salt. We kind of got off track. So what does the salt do for your athletes? Like why, what, what is it that they need from that salt? Uh, you know, it has to do with hydration and water retention and just everything moving through our bodies. Right. So um, my go-to salt is always just um, kosher salt, but uh, you know, when I, I use it enough that I know when I grab it and I season it, that's the effect it's going to have. Um, whenever I change salt, we just have a salt dish on our stove. Um, whenever I change it, even Morgan will be like, oh, something's wrong with the salt. <laughs> we change the salt. This is weird because he's used to how it affects what, you know, grabbing this particular flake and right. size of salt and what it does. Um, but for Tim, he specifically really likes, um, pink Himalayan salt. Uh, and 
I often use it for him, but I still more often than not just use kosher salt because I know I'll always be able to find that on the road. Right. Big, like two pound box for two bucks. Um, so I, I oversee what, what I seasoned for him is absolutely going to be way too salty for your average person. Um, but he comes back just covered. He's like dry and white salt all over his body. Wow. It's undeniable that he just is depleted when he comes back so um yeah salt is just that's the big thing yeah that's fascinating and I love that just because it you know it takes away that broad sweeping evilness to salt because clearly people need salt and and depending upon who you are it's like this individualized requirement right um so I always I, I always refer to um the situations for athletes right when people have this aversion to salt and clearly there's you know it's not like you can deny that a cardiologist if you're having issues you know they want you to be careful of your blood pressure and things that it can affect but I think on an an individual basis right we can't just set an evil precedence for all of these categories of flavor Um, and I always I always bring that up too and it comes with salt too it's like when I talk about salty I'm talking about the category of saltiness not just salt right because you can get the salty flavor from celery and, you know, almost every vegetable and herb, there's an element of saltiness to it. Right. So, um, Mm -hmm. it's just, I I love having the opportunity to highlight the fact that, um, the category of flavor is not the evil, right. It's what we've done to our food is what we've been inundating our bodies with when we don't have the requirements for high levels of, of sodium and salt in our bodies. Right. So, um, I'll tell you another example. Um, is whenever I feed Solomon, um, the brand Solomon, their athletes, um, they're, they're global team. So um, runners, skiers, climbers, et cetera, from Spain, France, Italy, uh, ever, everywhere else, uh, like the Basque region of, of Spain and France, um, they go through so much salt. Um, we fed their whole team at, at this one event in particular for Pikes Peak Marathon. Um, and we fed them for like 10 days. And so athletes from all over the world, literally the fastest hundred mile trail runner in the world. And every day I would just set an extra box of salt out on their table where they were eating and they would just like add. And again, I season really heavily for them, but he would add, I just watched him. I was always spying on him. Um, (laughs) easily a tablespoon of salt at every meal to his food. It was fascinating. Wow. That's, that's crazy. But, you know, again, I just feel like these, these, these are healthy people, right? These are people that know their bodies, they know what their bodies need and they understand, Absolutely. you know, you sweat, you lose salt, right? It's just, it, it's what happens. So um, yeah. that's really, really cool to hear. And I love, I don't know, I just love the stories of how chefs um, know how to flavor, they know how to make things taste good. And you recognize, right? Like when you're tasting food, do you taste your food as you go? Or you're just probably so instinctive at this point, you probably just make it. Do you taste as you go? It depends. I do. Um, I usually taste like halfway through and I, you know, because you cook in layers, I season every layer. I don't just season at the end because I want every layer to be seasoned properly. Um, I remember you giving us a hard time for not like seasoning both sides of garlic bread. Both sides. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's just right? a rookie mistake, right? Um, but other things that I really enjoy cooking with, like when I'm on the PCT, I don't know that I'll have storage space for it, but I put lemon zest on like everything. I love it just Bitter. brightens everything up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And lemon juice is great, but it doesn't hold the oils that the skin, that the peel does, right? So right, zest right. is such a... Um, and people are like, well, I don't know if I want something like pe- when people watch me cook, they're like, oh, you put red pepper flake in it. I don't like spicy things. I'm like, if I didn't, if you didn't see it, you wouldn't even know it was there. It just right. brightens it up. Right. Um, celery leaves are another one. I don't like celery, but I love cooking with celery leaves. They're so cool. They have such a unique, again, kind of brightness to them. So if you take celery leaves and lemon together, that's good stuff, right? That's like salty and sour all in one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So on that note, I have this dream 
I have a dream that <laughs> it feels really kind of um, irreverent to use that term, but I do have a dream. I want to, um, I would, I have this concept of what would happen if we could, instead of having something like a food pyramid, right? So I don't know if you've ever looked at food pyramids of other countries in the world, but every single food pyramid and every single entity that wants to tell us what to eat, every fad diet, every whatever, right? There's so much outside wisdom around what we're supposed to be eating, right? And, and, and I always talk about the reverence that we're not giving to our sense of taste as our own innate tool, right? This is what we have been given to detect nutrition. And yet, if you were to ask most people outside of athletes, perhaps, you know, do you trust your cravings? Do you trust that when you eat something delicious that it's good for you? People are like, well, like it's confusing, right? Because so much has happened to flavor and so much has happened to grow flavor out of our foods that there's not this education around how to trust our taste buds and what that flavor means. So my dream is that we can like self-empower ourselves by recognizing the five categories of flavor and even the minute um, differences in flavors in things. Like, you know, in kale, you have umami because it's high in protein. And if you can learn to detect umami and that flavor, you can always know that there's protein lying in that group, right? So you can eat, side by side, a piece of iceberg lettuce and a piece of kale and be like, oh, I taste umami. There's, I bet there's more protein in here. Well, yeah, hello, there is, right? So this idea of creating a flavor, not pyramid, but a flavor wheel, right? Something to help us recognize that these flavors are representing nutrition when you're eating the right flavors, right? Because of course there's a whole gamut of manufactured flavors that are completely messing with our taste buds. So I'm just curious, and because you're my friend, you can be completely honest with me. How crazy am I to have this idea? I don't think it's crazy at all, Sherry. I mean, it was it was Harvard, right, that added exercise to the latest food pyramid? Oh, I didn't know that. So if I was you, if you really want to do that, I would contact someone at Harvard many times, not just once, you know, when they shut the door in your face, but right, like right, right. repeatedly. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it is at all. I think it's really smart. Um, and your comment about the, you know, growing flavor out of food, I, I think that's spot on. And I don't, I don't know if you remember this. Um, I don't remember the gal's name. I think it was Monica. She owned the pizza oven at one of the farms that we went to. Yes. All of the students stayed overnight and made pizza yes. with her. Yes. Right. And the next that day. Giant we, oven. Yeah. Yeah, she was amazing. She was. We were at her house and we had all these carrots that came in. We were washing them. And I was like, I feel like she's going to stab me if I peel these carrots. <laughs> they're, they're like perfectly pristine, just out of the ground. Why would I peel it anyway? Like I wouldn't peel the carrot because it's a brand new, like virgin carrot. It hasn't been, it's not really old. It didn't sit in the ground until it got, you know, enormous and then sat in a grocery store forever. Right. Which, you know, in the United States, we were always like, you know, conditioned to like peel our vegetables and, and you're peeling that flavor off. And I said, Hey, Monica, I don't really want to peel these carrots. Are you cool with that? And she said, why would you peel it? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm cool. I just want to, I don't want to disrespect this woman, but I, I don't want to peel this carrot because I feel like that's disrespectful to the carrot. Right. Um, which anyone else sounds like a ridiculous conversation, but I know you understand that. Um, totally. But it is we've all we have absolutely grown flavor out of our foods because that carrot is like the best carrot on the planet right right um it was young it was just kind of pulled out of the ground it was just washed off um probably still had some dirt on it and <laughs> yeah yeah and good dirt like yeah. i talk about i actually talked about dirt in um i interviewed ethan frisch from burlap and barrel and we were talking about comparing spices and like he has this cinnamon that is just knock your socks off hot and sweet and delicious I'm like, it's like when you eat grocery store cinnamon, it's like eating dirt in a bad way. This would be dirt in a good way, right? Good dirt. <laughs> right. <getting> dirt. <laughs> right. Well, and so this is the arc, you know, honestly, Kelly, this is, this, this goes back to everything as to why I went to culinary school, where I went to culinary school, why all this matters so much to me. 
is this big connection, right? We can talk about our sense of taste as this innate tool and, you know, kind of try to re try to remove the all the outside knowledge and noise about what we're supposed to be eating and learn to trust our bodies. But the big picture here, my big message is that the way we get flavor, the way we get to enjoy our food and be healthy again through flavor mm -hmm. is by fixing our soils. We have to go back to growing food with flavor. And, and you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm attending all these like regenerative soil conferences. I'm learning from farmers. I'm basically kind of, you know, educating myself so that I can continue this conversation around nutrient density translating into flavor, which translates back into nutrients for us, right? It's this cycle of, of nutrition through the lens of flavor is really, Gary, really you need to reach out to people at Harvard. <laughs> I would like, whether something comes of it or not, I think you owe it to yourself to do that. Like if that's your, your dream, if that's your Martin Luther King, then you, <laughs> you owe it to yourself. Right. Um, well, and it's interesting because a friend of mine is a, um, he's a scientist in the MIT network. And he invited me to attend a, um, a nutrition conference. And like one of the women in there was talking about, um, she wasn't talking about it through the lens of flavor, but she was talking about all of the plants that create drug-like um, components, right? These plants, we're making pharmaceuticals out of plants, right? And so she was talking about the components, the elements of this drug and when the plant produces this element and, you know, when it's under stress, it produces this component. And, and she was talking and she's, and she was referring to one that I think is in like um, cabbage and Brussels sprouts. And she's like, and this is also probably the flavor that no one likes to eat. And I was like, if we start teaching ourselves, right? Like, cause this is part of what has happened in the flavor industry too, is that they're so attached to the fact that humans are drawn to salty and sweet that they're almost like they're removing the bitter they're removing the elements they're removing the medicinal stuff because they're telling people it tastes like poison or that it's bitter or that it's or they believe in their own minds that it's um offensive right so we're not even in a regular everyday life, we're not even exposed to these flavors that are so beneficial. So anyway, to your point, I thought about reaching out to them and being like, let's change the dialogue here, right? Let's talk about the importance of bitter. Herbalists talk about the importance of bitter. Mm -hmm. You know, in India, they're eating bitter food left and right. And let's not forget the fact that they have already become herd immune to COVID, right? <laughs> like, like there's, there's so much to experiencing these flavors that we in America have basically been either, um, you know, been manipulated. We're just inundated with salt and sugar so that we don't even think anything else is, is flavor, right? Like the only way people know how to flavor their food is to salt or sugar it. So it's this whole missing element of this prism right of flavors that we're missing out on and missing out on teaching our bodies what those flavors can do for us Absolutely. so yeah anyway so yeah i would love to hook up with someone from you know mit or harvard or whoever controls that food pyramid right and and the reason i bring up harvard is because i know they were successful in adding exercise to the food pyramid so we just need to start harassing the right people yeah. for you <laughs> All right. And so it is, right? We're just gonna make, we're just gonna say it's done. It's that somewhere down the line, we're already having this conversation. So awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. This has just been just first of all, good to see you and chat with you and hear of all your successes. Like I haven't even really been connected enough to know you're working for Adidas and Solomon and training world. I mean, of course it makes sense, but it's really cool to hear the stories. And um, I wish you all the best on your big journey. And I'm gonna, just going to remind you to take care of you because <laughs> I know you. What, I have like a <laughs> little, a, a small list of creature comforts that I will bring to help take care of myself. Uh, and uh, is Morgan taking care of the dogs while you're gone? <laughs> oh, you're going to miss the puppies. I have like this, it oh. like physically hurts my heart. Like oh. obviously I will miss Morgan, but I can talk to him or FaceTime him, but to not have, you know, 300 pounds of dog by my side oh. was like going to crush me. So, um, I know. 
I'm like, I don't know how to manage that yet. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. I'm like, how can I drive them out to you? <laughs> I know. Yeah. So yeah, Morgan will be um uh single dadding it for for a couple months. So <laughs> well, he's got to keep up with the Hank Williams up high Instagram account. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> He'll have to go on hiatus for two months. <laughs> that's a that's a component I'm not even going to ask about. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh my well, goodness! Thank you, Sherry. It's always great to catch up with you. I'm really proud of what you're doing. Thank you, thank you. It's taken me a long time, but it feels really important. So hopefully, it'll uh, catch on, and we can you know keep the conversation going around it. So yeah, I appreciate your time so much. I mean. You're welcome. It's really an honor to um, to have you on my show. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, Sherry.